Good morning. Good morning. You know what? It always looks better from here when there are more back there. I gave this book out, but we're not ready for it yet. Okay? Just hold on to it. I was trying to see maybe where we were uh, quantity-wise in case I have to order some more. And if I do, then we'll have them in time when we start. We're in this handout, Reason and Revelation, talking about the providence of God. One of the things that I haven't learned nearly as much as I'd like to as a preacher and a teacher, but one of the things I learned early on is if people ask for something to study or they ask a particular Bible question to be answered, there's probably more than one person that would like to have that question answered. And I know uh, Lisa was talking about it on the way up here, about wanting to study on providence. So if we, you were here last week, you know we started on page one of this handout in a study of the providence of God uh, by the late uh, Wayne Jackson. I've been studying his material since 1982. That's 40 years, isn't it? Right at Very, very good student of scripture. He was not inspired but he has produced some of the better material. And uh, if you want more material, there is. If you, if you look at ChristianCourier.com, you can go in there and search for Providence. And there's a similar article there. Uh, there are a lot of other things. I thought this one might be, but it's not exact. We got down to point number three under some basic ideas concerning God's activity in the world, but I wanted to ask a question. What is the basic theory of deism? You remember? I set up a world and just left it to its own devices. Okay. God set up the world and kind of a hand, had a hands off. You know, it's kind of like to help me out here, this is somewhat related. We've been seeing some and hearing some baby birds. Aren't those birds pretty much on their own after they're pushed out of the nest? So some people see God like that. that he has nothing to do with anything that goes on. And I had made the comment that, uh, and some people have said this, that some of the founding fathers of this country were deists. Deism is not defined by one simple definition. If you go back and read some of their statements, some of their writings, um, you, you, I didn't get the idea that they were deists in the sense that God had a hands off. But uh, some of them may have. But they're different uh, varieties of the term. They did believe in God. It's unfortunate that people have devolved to the point that they don't. And I want to look at something before we start this. Look at Matthew chapter 6. And uh, verse 20. Well... Don't you hate it when you saw something and then you go look at it and it's not there? How about Matthew 5? 43 through 45. Matthew 5, 43 through 45. I want to look at a point here. Bless you. Who would read that so everybody could hear it? Steve? You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So which verse do you think I was really focusing on with regard to providence? God causes... 
sunshine rolls on everybody whether they believe in God or, or love him dearly this morning because God made it happen. And the rain came last night from God and God gives it. And we, so we pass all these, uh, I guess they're farms, they're huge fields between, especially once you get off North Valdosta Road and head this way and uh, they grow all kinds of things. The sunshine for those, for those uh, that produce and the rain came from the hand of a benevolent God. How dare an individual say this came from nothing and then take everything that nothing gave them and act like it's just come from nothing. That's absurd. Now, God operate, the reason I went to Matthew 6, 45 in particular, God does not promise the same things to the unrighteous and the righteous in every way, does he? He's talking to us as Christians, though. We need to love the unrighteous. God gives them rain and sunshine. God does that much for them. He makes himself known. We need to love them. But providence simply defined, in, if you look at providence uh, defined, it says it comes from a Latin word. I'm under providence defined on page one. Uh, providencia, I think it's the same thing in Spanish, maybe spelled differently. Simple, signifying foresight. God looks forward and takes care of what's coming. What's the greatest thing that God has looked forward to make sure something happens that's really, 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 really good for his people? Savior. Savior, a Savior. But I'm talking about past that. But that's a good answer. But I'm thinking about between now and... Judgment. Judgment. The resurrection. Resurrection and eternity. You know, what is the... What is a... If a deist thinks that God has no hands on, what does he think about resurrection? He may not think it's even going to happen. The atheist doesn't. Um, we believe it. And God has provided salvation. Don't you wish everybody loved that like they ought to? Don't you wish we loved it better than we do sometimes, Sister Skinner? We love salvation, but maybe we don't love it enough, and that's a lifetime challenge, isn't it? it sure is. So God has provided that. Here in uh, the Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible, uh, the, and one explanation is providence concerns God's support, care, and supervision of all creation from the moment of the first creation to all the future into eternity. God's not a hands-off God, then, is he, Brenda? He's a hands-on God. Does God have physical hands and eyes and ears? No. But he still has a... You know, the Bible has to use these descriptions because that's what we understand, isn't it? You know, you could say God gives us a helping hand. He really doesn't have a hand, but then he has a hand in everything. These figures we understand... Uh, Elisa was thanking God on the way home yesterday for us having wonderful weather to do what we did out here. If it had started raining in the middle of it, we wouldn't have finished, would we? Not, not right then, anyway. I think we need to do more than define terms. I don't think it, I know. We need to be appreciative. Look on the top of page two here. Well, we're continuing. At the bottom of page one, the concept of providence is thus, as indicated above, opposed to deism, which asserts God's not interest in the world. Additionally, it is the opposite of fate or chance. I want to tell you something, and, and, and Brother Steve might want to chime in on this, or any of the rest of you for that matter. He brought the subject up, and that's why we're talking about it. So if you don't like it, you can blame him. But, oh, seriously, 
God can do wonderful things or cause wonderful things to happen in our lives and we might not even pay attention to it. And I believe that's one of the reasons when good things happen, we need to thank God for it. We, 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 he's not, I did that. He's not working that way, is he? He might even put something, what we call bad, for us to make us be more appreciative of the better. God, God has hands on, but does he manipulate everything that happens? No. If he did, and, and Brother Wayne's going to touch on this, then what happens to free will? You know, um, we choose, we chose this morning. No, we didn't choose this morning. We chose a long time ago. We're going to get up and get ready on Sunday mornings and, and and go to Bible study and worship. We chose that a long time ago, but even so, we could have decided this morning not to do it. We do have free will. I don't usually do that with meals, but but seriously, uh, we, we have free choice. But thinking about, look, in this, in fate or chance is what I'm focusing on. I don't believe in fate or chance um, as seeing the world events as uncontrollable without any element of benevolent purpose. That is a key aspect of evolutionary atheism. Why would I say that? Why would I say that fate or chance is a key aspect of evolutionary atheism. I think because those people say that there is no God in hand. Okay, so we, so that you are where you are because that's just the way things turned out. You know, it's just odd to me. I was I'm, I'm buying a book. I think I bought it, and it's on my next to read list. Whenever I get to it, on the uh, on the the design theory. There's a designer. Somebody designed this jacket. I wish they'd have designed it a little. Of course, it fit me when I bought it. But seriously, it has a name in there. And uh, I figure I could check with the label in here and say, did, did you all make this? And say, yep. So and so designed it. And yet we can look at the world and say, well, you know, the design theory is kind of iffy, I think. When's the last time you looked at the human eye? You ever go to the eye doctor? Look at that, diag that, that uh, what do they call it? Uh, oh, diagram. Yeah, but it's, it's raised, what they call it. Anyway, it, and I was looking at it the other day and I thought, that is amazing. Just the human eye. And then you come in there with that doctor and say he's an atheist. I say, did that just happen? He said, yep. Yeah. And I come in there with one of these new fandangled uh, electronic digital cameras. Well, who made this? Well, it's got a name on there. Sony made it. No, they didn't. It, one day I was walking along, it just fell out of the sky. And I caught it. That's about how much sense it makes, though, isn't it? I mean, why am I bringing this up? The designer also is a provider of precious people. He, 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 he provided this doctor. My doctor's not an atheist, by the way. I'm just using that as an illustration. I don't know what his religious convictions are. He's a good eye doctor. Uh, but he's provided these medical people for us. Aren't you thankful? That he gave people the mind to be able to understand the, the anatomy of the human body and focus on one aspect of it. If I've got a problem with my eye, I'm going to that doctor. I'm not going to the veterinarian for that. Now, a veterinarian, you know, they have to study a lot more in the medical field than a regular doctor. They treat horses and cats and dogs and fish. And I don't know what all, and they have to do, a, they have to study all kinds of animals. 
Yeah, there's more schooling for a veterinarian than there is an eye doctor, I think. But And then I have a friend who's a dentist. Aren't you thankful whether you like it or not, if you have trouble? But God gave these people their minds and the ability to learn this. Is that providence? Yes, it is. It is. And so we should not take anything for granted that helps us. I like apples. I eat one a day, sometimes two. Um, and, and they're supposed to be good for you, you know, different ways. And grapes and things like that. God provided that, didn't he? And I don't know what your favorite foods are, and I'm not trying to make you hungry. If you skip breakfast, I can't help you. But, but God's provided these things. Now, <clears throat> at this point, I'm in the first full paragraph here at the top of page two. At this point, the following observation needs to be made. While God exercises a general providence over the universe, and that's the rain, the sunshine, the oxygen, the balance of the universe and the balance of nature and all the food we have. He has a special providence and care which the Heavenly Father manifests on behalf of his regenerate children. Children of God have it better than anybody. And if we don't, it's kind of like Let's say that you could go to the grocery store, especially we're, we're entering a recession, whether we like it or not. And I know you know that. And you, somebody says, i tell you what, uh, Robbie and Frankie, we're going to, you can go to whatever your favorite grocery store is and you can buy enough groceries for a month, give them whatever you want. <clears throat> That'd be pretty nice, wouldn't it? That's kind of, but, but what happens if you decide not to go? I'm not picking on y'all. I'm just, what if you decide not to go? You're not going to get the benefit, are you? God provides special things for his children. Let us, let us take advantage of these blessings like prayer. And, uh, you know, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, God, through Isaiah, told the children of Israel, I'm not listening to your prayers because you're, you've got, you're, you're living in sin. That's a sad commentary, isn't it? The Lord's hand is not shortened and it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated your God and your sins have hidden his face from him. Did God hear their prayers? No. Why? They ignored God. They were, they, were, they were cutting themselves off from the providence of God in that blessing, right? And I'm not trying to hammer on this. I'm just saying it is a wonderful blessing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, God blesses us, doesn't he? And I would to God, I want you all to pray about something. Let's take advantage of this. We are quickly, and if any, I know Kathy's a school teacher. I don't know if she encounters this much, and you may encounter it on the job, but we are quickly raising a generation of godless, and what I mean, atheistic, Robbie knows. And they said, well, who told you there's no God? My mama did. And that's all they know. They don't have any idea why they're saying that. But the point is, they are saying it. And two things to pray about. Um, the Internet is a powerful tool for preaching. Not everybody's going to listen to it, but it's there. And... Uh, Mike Hickson called me the other day. Want to know if I'd do an online lesson uh, on evangelism? I said, "Yeah, I'll do that." Why? Because people need it. It gets us outside this building. Gets us. I don't know where all the video will go. I've got to do a good job with it. But people need to know that somebody still believes in God. They still believe in the gospel. They still believe in the Bible. And God is not dead or non-existent. Pray that this, these efforts, there are people <laughs> preaching and teaching on the internet and other ways all over the world. 
And Jesus said at one point, pray for laborers. And pray that these people will listen. If this country, I know I'm on a galloping horse here, but if this country continues to, to go more and more atheistic, what do you think is going to happen to it? It'll be just like Russia. Maybe worse. This country already turns on itself at the drop of a hat because of somebody's skin color or they think somebody's offended them. It all boils down to this. It's a lack of appreciation for God. But if you love and appreciate him, you appreciate what he's done for you. So the special providence, people need to know, it's not that, you know, what, what kind of race do they use? Don't they put something out in front of some of these dogs when they run? A rabbit. It's not a real rabbit, is it? But, uh, but you know, it's kind of like the, Put the carrot, you know. God's not holding out carrots to see if you can catch the carrot. He wants to bless people. That's the point I'm trying to make. I've got this little toy we played with the cat. And it's just a toy. And she catches it. She's not going to be blessed. Some people catch one thing and think they're being blessed. God wants to bless us through and through. There's a difference between loving God and obeying Him and being blessed. And there's a difference between that and just saying, well, I'll do as little as I can for God to receive special blessings. I mean, there's a big difference. And God knows the difference because He knows each person and He knows the heart of the motive. Look at John chapter 15 and verse 7. Jesus is talking to his apostles. But the benevolent, the special providence of God is based on, it is conditional. How many of y'all like to fish? If somebody told you, what's your favorite fish to fish for, Frankie? Bass. What if somebody told you that there were more bass than you could shake a stick at over there in that lake at Ray Bingham? And said, if you'll use this bait, you'll catch more than you more than you take home. You'll have to put some back. You go and yeah, boy. If then, if you go, if you get the bait, if you get the boat or whatever you need to get to the fish. Jesus said, if you abide in my words, some people say, well, God's just blessing me. They don't, they don't pay attention to what God says. That is a misunderstanding and a miscalculation of the blessings of God. The blessings of God do not say, do not have Range Rover on the back of the vehicle. Now, it might be a blessing to somebody, but that's, or whatever. If you abide in my words, and I abide, and if you abide, I'm, let me read this again. If you abide in me, what's the second part say, Robbie? Oh, you don't have your Bible. I'm listening to you. Okay, okay, sorry. What's the second part say, Tony? And my words abide in you. And my words abide in you. So you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, there, there are limitations to that, but he's basically talking to the apostles about their, their uh, charge to go out and preach the gospel. If you'll abide in me, I will make it possible for you to do what we've been talking about in John 14, 15, and 16. And that's primarily preaching the gospel. But if, if, if we abide in Jesus and his words abide in us, will he provide for us the spiritual things we need? Maybe we're not abiding closely enough. I don't know. I'm not speaking for anybody. But I know this. You know, when I was in school, I memorized scripture. I had to. I went to a Christian school in Chattanooga, and Mom would help me memorize these verses. And I can tell you back then, my goal was to memorize that chapter. The words didn't abide in me, but they did. If you know what I mean, I memorized those words, but I didn't pay any attention to what they meant. 
you know. But later on, I got a little older and I started to remember some of those, like the Psalms I memorized, then they started to have some meaning to me. When God's word starts having meaning to you, then it abides in you, not just in your mind, but in your thought processes and your actions. And then, and and you think, well, you know, I think it's just not going too well for me. I've been trying to live the Christian life. Could we be missing John fifteen seven? We could, could. We? Um, at least I got some medicine from the doctor. Though. Told her how to use it. He's got the instructions on it. Will that medicine do her any good? She doesn't follow the instructions and use it. No. Will God's word bless our lives if we don't follow the instructions and use it? No. That's not hard to understand. Look at James five sixteen. Uh, Mike Kalinowski, if you would read that. trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Confess your sins to one another. The word that's used there means publicly. Publicly. How public should it be known? It should be made known as public as it's known. Publicly as it's known. If I sin against this church and I go tell one person, did I do what James 5, 16 said? No. I need to tell the whole church, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Um, if it's between myself and another person, then I don't need to tell the whole church about it. Um, but it's an if-then. It is an if-then verse. And you could say, if you confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, you may be healed. You will be healed. Now, I believe the healing here, it's kind of confusing sometimes to me, I'll be honest with you, because he's talking about being sick in verse 14, and he's talking about being sick and in verse 15, but when he talks about confessing sin, do you think the sickness is physical or spiritual? It shifts from the physical to the spiritual, doesn't it? Um, and if I want to be spiritually healthy as a Christian, if I've done wrong, I need to confess it. And first of all, confess it to who? God. To God. But, and he says, what kind of person does, does the effective, what kind of person must a person be to have an effective prayer? righteous man. Now I want to I want to qualify that. There's not a perfect person on this earth. The only perfect person who ever graced this earth was Jesus, right? But righteousness simply means doing right, wanting to do what God says. It's not, oh well, I've got it all fixed. Well, if you had it all fixed, you don't need to talk to God in the first place. But a person desiring to do what God wants. And so and I want you to think about this. You're trying to live a Christian, faithful Christian life. And you pray about it. So first of all, the forgiveness aspect. And then I believe he stretches beyond that because he uses illustration. Who's the illustration that he uses in verse 17? Elijah. Elijah. And what did Elijah do? What kind of nature did he have? Well, yeah, but it says a man with a nature like ours. In other words, he was human. He wasn't superhuman. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And we studied that not long ago in 1 Kings 19. And uh, it did not rain on earth for three years and six months. I don't think God's answering that kind of prayer now. He's using the illustration of the power of prayer. God had a plan to do with that. Uh, and, and against Ahab and how they had turned against God. But the point is, the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Do not ever doubt the power of prayer from a righteous person. 
Don't ever doubt it. Too many people want to be up in front of the church, and I wish more did, but and, and we need more preachers and elders and deacons. But with more than that, we need me. Can't get my tang untongued. More praying people. Righteous praying people. And and when I pray for the Ukraine, I pray that those people are provided what they need spiritually. Some of them have already died. We've lost brothers and sisters in Christ. It's sad. But if they had Jesus, they died with everything. Didn't they, Steve? They didn't lose a thing. You're going to die anyway. That's not a fun way to go. Who will read 1 Peter 3.12? Who has not read it would read that. And who is he that will harm you if you if you be followers of that which is good? Um what are you reading, Sister Skinner? First Peter three and twelve. That's not what I'm seeing in my She's reading thirteen. Yeah. Oh, okay. Back up verse above it. There you go. How about start with verse 10, if you don't mind. Right. Let's put it all together. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no God. Let him, I can't say that word, Okay, stop right there. Thank you. So the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. There is a special providence of God for people who are trying to live right. You want to know whose lives are going the best? Well, it's not Elon Musk. Somebody said he became a believer. I don't know if he did or not, but you know why I'm saying that. All that money. The poorest person in the world can be the one God listens to. Not because they're poor, but because they're trying to live a righteous life. Don't ever doubt the power of prayer or the providence of God for God's righteous praying people. And so his face is against those who do evil. It kind of takes you back to Isaiah 59. So there is a special, here, here we are, so this special providence have you ever seen somebody that got a big license tag on the front of their vehicle? Maybe it's a real fancy one. It says blessed on it. I've often wondered why that's there. I don't know unless I ask them. They may not mean anything to do with that fancy car. It may be something else. But if you were going to put a blessed tag on your car or wear a t-shirt that said blessed and it had a biblical meaning to it, what would it mean? It'd be spiritual, wouldn't it? And Jesus promised material blessings too with the necessities of life for those who are faithful. Yes, he did. He did. And 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 we have uh, we have those blessings. And can your vehicle be a blessing? Oh yeah. If you use it for God's purposes. Yes, sir. I don't think we should desire those things in the in the wrong way. But I think it's it, it's good for a Christian to be to recognize that he's been blessed in whatever way, and to be thankful for what he's been able to have. You know, not not with pride or, or show that you. Right. I was reading uh, the the mission magazine from Forest Park, and they've had that school in Panama since the 1960s, training preachers. And back in. Uh, early 90s they bought 25 acres of land not too far from the airport and people would donate money to build dormitories 
Is that, is that a blessing? Somebody recently bought them a nice tractor so they could have their own garden. I told them to do that a long time ago. They said, well, we don't have the tools for it. Well, somebody finally got them a tractor. And now they can grow their own food right there on that land. That tractor's a blessing, isn't it? Well, yeah, sure it is. And so we do have the physical. And, and yet, when we read these passages, you know, it's... There's so much more, and let us not, I'm not ignoring or discounting at all what Steve said, it, it's true. But more, more, more than that is the peace that passes all understanding. Right. And uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, it's talk, you know, do not worry. What does that mean? Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I was talking with someone recently. I said, my truck is 11 years old, but it's 68,000 miles on it, I think not bad. I said, but if somebody offered me a brand new one, they got those chips and said, you just take the brand new one, you think I'd take it? Oh yeah, in a heartbeat. If they're going to give it to me and pay the taxes. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, you know, but in my study with this individual, I said, but what's the greatest blessing? You know, God has offered us his son and, I, and somebody can buy us a brand new vehicle every year. But if we don't have Jesus, we have nothing. Not really. But this prayer, don't, don't you know, and so this, the emphasis of these verses is on prayer. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Uh, <coughs> Kathy Jones, would you read that? 1 John 5, 14 and 15. qualifying statement in verse uh, 14. If we ask according to his will. And that means, that kind of takes us back to John uh, chapter 15 and verse 7. Abide in me. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you will. So we know what God's word teaches and, and we should have a spiritual mindset the things we ask for should have a spiritual purpose one way or another you think that's what he means yeah it's a spiritual purpose now we got a letter not long ago somebody I don't even know the people they needed some help building a church building and I'm thinking well if they really need one that's a spiritual purpose we had to have help with our roof a couple of years ago that it was not simply a physical purpose, it was a spiritual purpose. So we could continue to meet here and our building wouldn't ruin. And so every, but if we ask according to God's will, that tells me that I need to be spending my time in understanding what God wants me to know and do. Because James also talks about us, talks about people asking for prayers to spend it on their pleasures. Yes. Yeah, you ask amiss. God doesn't hear and answer everything we ask him for. You ever have you? I was with my granddaddy one time. I don't know how old I was. We were do, going out checking an alarm system, and I, I wasn't old enough to drive then. And I saw a toy, of course. You know, I said, Granddaddy, would you get that for me? He said, No, you don't need that. And, and I, I didn't. I didn't need it. Now, grandmother would have bought it, but she wasn't there. But, but the point is, God will give us what we need. And that takes us back to, to Matthew 6, doesn't it? The things we need.
Right. Now, the next section will deal... So, uh, our next section deals with principles for understanding divine providence. And, and I would underscore principles. So... I'm just going to read these off. I'm not going to go through them today because we're out of time. But number one, God never providentially operates in any way that is in conflict with his nature or his revealed will. Number two, divine providence does not negate man's freedom of will. Number three, the providential must be distinguished from the miraculous. And we'll talk, we'll talk about that some. And... Uh, and then he delves into that. And I want to tell you in this uh, in this book, some of these chapters in here deal with some of these. But it, you know, I've learned this. Sometimes I need to study some things more than once to fix it in my mind, so it won't hurt. You know, repetition is the key to learning. I've heard that somewhere. So we will stop and we'll pick up with the principles for understanding divine providence, Lord willing, next week.